Good morning, Saddleback. It's good to see you. I want to say hi to all 10 of our campuses and uh, all of you in the different venues and those of you outside and those of you who are watching online, we're glad to have you part. If you take out your message notes, last week uh, we began a new series I'm calling When Jesus Comes to Dinner. And it's just a little mini series we're doing in the couple weeks before Easter. You see, it was the dinners with sinners that got Jesus in trouble. The, the religious people of Jesus' day just couldn't stand Jesus. The really self-righteous folks, they didn't like him because he hung out with all the wrong people. He was always going to dinners with sinners. He was always partying with people they didn't like, people that they didn't think he should be hanging out with, and it ticked off the churchgoers. Last week, Pastor Buddy did the first message in the series. We looked at when Jesus had dinner with a prostitute and a Pharisee. Now that's the opposite extremes, the very self-righteous and the very unrighteous. That would have been an interesting conversation, I'm sure. This week we're gonna look at when Jesus goes to dinner with a corrupt government official that everybody in town hated. Next week, which is the week before Easter, we're gonna actually look at the Passover. We're gonna do the Passover here on stage. We're gonna have communion. And by the way, the next Sunday evening, we're gonna show the Passion in the refinery. So we're gonna take it in order. Uh, the, the Passover, uh, a service, and then uh, communion, and then Jesus' uh, death on the cross. And I hope you wanna bring a friend to that. But when Jesus did the Passover, the most important dinner of his life, the Lord's Supper, he invites a bunch of... <laughs> exactly what the disciples were they weren't exactly sophisticated people they came from Galilee Galilee was Hickville these people were country bumpkins they watched reruns of hee-haw I mean they they were illiterate they were very rough-hewn men and Jesus does not gather for his world-changing group a bunch of intellectual very sophisticated people he gets a bunch of illiterate country hicks and has dinner with them. You know, I, I can, you know I, in my life, I have received a fair amount of criticism from bloggers and things like that for people that I have tried to befriend. Now, as an evangelist, I spend much of my time with people who totally disagree with me. And does that make sense? I mean, if you have the gift of sharing the good news, you don't just share it with people who already understand it. So I spend much of my time talking to people who totally disagree with me. And I would disagree with them. And, and I have, you know, they've written all kinds of things about, you know, Rick Warren has had dinner with this religious group or that religious group, or he's had dinner with, uh, you know, atheists or, or gays or worst of all, liberals, you know? And <laughs> I mean, that's like the highest sin of all. That's the unpardonable one, okay? Liberals and, and uh, and, 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 and you know, as if, you know, well then that means I agree with everything, everybody I've ever had dinner with. Well, of course not. Can you imagine if Jesus were alive today, what the bloggers was to say about Jesus having dinner with a prostitute uh, or a corrupt government official or all the other, quote, sinners? He hung out with lepers. These were the offcasts of society that nobody wanted to hang out with. It's like, it'd be like people who have AIDS today who people are, I'm afraid I might get it, so I want to get away as far away as possible. And, uh, you know, Jesus, his answer to all of this was always, hey, the well don't need a doctor. It's the sick people who need a doctor. 
And Jesus says many times, several times, he actually says, I didn't come for the righteous, I came for the unrighteous. I didn't come for the saved, I came for the lost. I didn't come for people who think they've all got it all together and don't need to be saved. I came to save people who realize they're broken, they don't have it all together, The things don't always work in life. Frankly, people who think they don't need to be saved, I don't have any time for. But I came to be with people who know they need help. I came for the insecure. Now, the truth is, and I've learned this after 30 years of pastoring, everybody is insecure. Everybody in this room, everybody's listening, is insecure. You say, oh no, I'm not insecure. Oh really, let me have 30 minutes with you and I'll uncover your hidden insecurities. <laughs> I can do it quite quickly, I'm very good at discovering what people's insecurities are. It's the reason why people don't get help before things get really bad in their life. If your marriage is tanking and going down and you don't get counseling, or your business is tanking and you don't get help, or you got a relationship problem with your parents or your kids and you don't get help, and you don't get counseling, and, and, and why do people are afraid to go to a counselor? Because of insecurity. What if that counselor reveals something to me that I can't handle and he points out a truth about myself that I don't really want to know. That's called insecurity. And it's the reason why people wait until it's too late to get help in an area of their life. It's because of their own insecurity. What can they uncover that I, I can't handle? Now the truth is one of your deepest needs in life is to feel secure. One of your deepest needs in life is to feel valued to feel valuable, to feel like your life matters, that it counts, that it's significant, that you're not just a cipher, that you're not just some kind of zero in life. You want your life to matter. You want your life to have value and significance. And as a result, you're constantly doing two things, evaluating and comparing, and you do it all the time. You do it consciously and you do it unconsciously. You're evaluating yourself and you're comparing yourself to other people. And we compare everything. It's an indoor national favorite pastime of Americans. And the problem is the four ways that we judge our value are all spurious. They're all false, they're all phony, they're all fake. How the world tells you you determine your value is 100% wrong. So let me just mention them because I want you to understand that your value is not based on what the world says about you, it's what God says about you. Now there are four things that the world tells you you need to look at if you want to know how valuable you are. You might write these down. The first way we judge our wealth or our worth is by our appearance. And that is, how do I look? And we think, you know, if I look good, then I must be good. And if I don't look so good, then I must not be so valuable, I must not be important. And our society has an entire industry that is built on the idea that your value is based on your appearance. It's called Hollywood. And Hollywood says, if you really are ravishing, you're stunning, you're really gorgeous, you're really handsome, then you're really worth a lot. But if you're not so hot, then you're not. Oh, I'm a poet and I don't know it. <laughs> now the, the problem with this is there aren't that many really stunning people in the world. I mean, most of us are just normal, average looking people. In fact, everybody around you is normal, average, except you, you're stunning. <laughs> and you know it. But you're the only person in this room that actually really is stunning. All the rest of us are just kind of normal looking. Okay, we're just normal people with normal looks. Now, if you only have high value in your life by being super attractive, that leaves most of us out. And the Bible says that's not what you evaluate yourself on. The second false way to evaluate your worth is not appearance, but by affluence. And affluence is, what do I own? And that's the myth of materialism that says, if I have a lot of things, then I must be worth a lot. That if I have a lot of values, then my personal value is a lot. But if I'm poor or I'm broke, then I'm not worth much as a person. Now, I've told you many times, never connect your self-worth 
with your net worth. Because if you connect your self-worth with your net worth, the recession will cause depression. And I have seen that many, many times. I've seen a lot of people who, when their business hits the toilet, then their personal feeling about themselves hits the toilet. And when they tank in their portfolio, then they tank in how good they feel about themselves. And I'm just not a very good provider, and on and on and on. Your value and your valuables have nothing to do with each other. Your self-worth and your net worth have nothing to do with each other. The greatest things in life, as I've said many times, are not things. But the world tells you, you got a lot of money, you got a lot of stuff, then you are really a valuable person. Not true. The third thing that we judge our worth on is achievement. And that is, what have I accomplished? And if I get a lot of things done, then I feel good about myself. And if I reach a lot of goals, then I feel good about myself. And if I get promoted, or I win a trophy, or I get an honor, and I have accomplished a certain thing, then I must feel good. And this is what creates workaholism. And it drives us because we want to feel good about ourselves, so we're trying to achieve to prove that we are worthwhile. The fourth is approval. And approval, uh, uh, basing your worth on approval says, how well am I liked? And if I'm liked a lot, then I must be worth a lot. And if I'm only liked a little, then I'm worth a little. And if I'm not liked by anybody, then I'm worthless. That's just not true. Some of you have spent your entire life trying to gain the approval of somebody who's never going to give it. And if you haven't got your parents' approval by now, I'm sorry, you're not going to get it. But here's the point. You don't need it to be happy. Your happiness is not dependent upon the approval of other people. If you build your worth on what other people think of you, then you are going to be devastated every time you get criticized. And it's going to hurt like the Dickens, and you're going to tend to always be going around saying, what will other people think? And if you're always asking that question, what do other people think? You're already a slave to the approval of other people. You've got to learn to trust what God says about you. Now, it is true, psychological studies have shown that you tend to base how you feel about you on what you think the most important person in your life thinks about you. That's where you get most of your self-esteem. What you think the most important person in your life thinks about you. So I highly recommend you make the most important person in your life Jesus Christ. Because he's going to tell you the truth and he's going to love you unconditionally and he's not going to say, I love you if, I love you if, I love you if, I love you if, I love you if you love me, I love you if, or I love you because, that's conditional love. Jesus says, I love you, period. In fact, you can't make me stop loving you. Now the problem with these four things, appearance and affluence and achievement and approval, is that they are, are all unstable unreliable sources of security. I mean, let's just go down the list. Um, our beauty fades. Anybody want to give a testimony on that? <laughs> okay, our, our, our beauty fades. And if you think you're not looking so great now, wait 10 years. <laughs> okay, all right? Okay, unless you're like me on the Daniel plan and in 10 years, I'm not half the man I used to be. <laughs> <laughs> All right, beauty fades, possessions wear out, okay? Successes are surpassed. No matter what goal you reach, somebody's gonna break your record and you're gonna feel bad then if your self-esteem is built on that. And other people are gonna reject you. No matter what you do, some people just aren't gonna like you. That's their problem, not yours. The only solid foundation for self-esteem, for feeling good about you, is understanding how much you matter to God. And that's what we're gonna look at today. How much you matter to God. And if you get what we're gonna look at today, it'll change your life and it will set you free from the expectations of others, from the grip of materialism, from the pressure of workaholism, from the need to have to improve and always look your best at every time, when you see yourself as God sees you, it transforms you. 
Now, a great example of this is a guy in the Bible named Zacchaeus. And his story is in Luke chapter 19. If you have a Bible, you can turn to Luke 19. Uh, it's there on your outline. You can read the verses with me. It's also on the screen. Now, Jesus is going through a town called Jericho. And, of course, large crowds are following Jesus wherever he goes. He's walking through these cities, and crowds are following him everywhere. And there's a guy in this town named Zacchaeus who is the most hated man in the city. And the Bible tells us this story. Luke 19. Jesus was going through the city of Jericho. And a man was there named Zacchaeus. And he was the chief tax collector. And he was wealthy. Now he wanted to see who Jesus was, but he was too short. Too short to see above the crowd. So he ran ahead of the place where Jesus would come and he climbed a sycamore tree so he could see him. Now when Jesus is walking through, when Jesus comes to that place and then there was this sycamore tree, he stops, it says he looked up and he said to Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down. I must stay at your house today. Zacchaeus came down quickly and he welcomed him gladly. Now, now all the people who saw this, they began to complain. Jesus is having dinner with a sinner. Jesus is staying with a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, uh, this is at his house, I will give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anyone, I will pay them back four times as much. And Jesus says to him, Salvation has come to this house today. This man is a true son of Abraham. In other words, he's the real deal. He's in with us. And I, the son of man, have come to seek and save people like him who were lost. Now, this is an amazing story. Now, Zacchaeus, uh, of the four ways that we judge our value, this guy has struck out on three of them. Okay, he struck out, he is wealthy because of his, his, uh, his uh, uh, corruption, but he has struck out in three different ways. In the first place, Zacchaeus doesn't like his appearance. The Bible tells us he was short. In fact, he was so short, he couldn't see above the crowd, and he was shorter than everybody else in the city. In fact, tradition tells us that Zacchaeus was the shortest man in the city of, uh, of Jericho. In fact, the Greek word here for short describes the body of an underdeveloped child. This man is not just short, like a lot of people are short. He is abnormally short. He's a little person, probably dwarfed. He's abnormally short, a, a, an undeveloped, fully developed body. Now, because of that, he's probably teased and ridiculed his entire life about his height. Can kids be cruel and ruthless on the, on the playground? Oh, you can remember it. Kids can be meaner than adults. And on the patio, they can say all kinds of mean things about the way you look or the way you dress or what you did. And, and probably Zacchaeus' entire life was given hurtful, cruel nicknames. And he learns real quickly, don't worry about the opinions of other people because he was constantly made fun of. He didn't like his appearance. He's abnormally short, stunted. He falls short. Second, uh, Zacchaeus was not liked by anybody else. So the approval factor is zero. In, in fact, he was the chief tax collector, and that means he's hated by everybody. Now, tax collectors are never popular people. I mean, you don't just call up the IRS and say, come over for dinner and do an audit. Okay, Th that's not something you normally, normally want to do. But in those days... Uh, it was even worse because the Roman tax system was 100% corrupt to the core. In the first place, in order to become a tax collector, you had to bribe an official to get that job. Because once you got it, you were going to make an awful lot of money. But you had to bribe an official to become a tax collector. So you had to be dishonest just to get the job. Then, in the Roman tax collection system. Rome didn't care how much you collected as long as they got their percentage. And you could collect two, three, four, five, up to ten times as much as Rome required and keep it all for yourself. 
So really, a tax collector in this days is more like a mafia extortionist. He can come to your house and say, you're going to pay me this amount of money when Rome's only said this much and they, he said this much. And if you don't do it, I'm going to throw you in jail. I'm going to make you an offer you can't refuse. And you will pay tribute to me. So everybody hated the tax collectors because not only did they represent Rome, which was the invading country of Israel and they were under subjugation by a foreign country, so they hated Rome. But second, the Roman tax collector was corrupt and you knew that that guy was going to get rich off of you by being dishonest. And you couldn't stop him. He could extort all he wanted to from you. Now, for a Roman, for a Jew, which Zacchaeus is, to become a Roman tax collector is like treason. It's like going over to the enemy's side. No self-respecting Jew would ever become a Roman tax collector. It was unthinkable. Without a doubt, Zacchaeus was disowned by his family because no family is going to have a son who represents Rome in the most corrupt area of taxes. So he's disowned by his family. In fact, in those days, you were barred from going to worship if you worked for Rome. You could not go to the Jewish synagogue because they believed you, 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 know, you had sold out. In fact, Jewish law in that day meant that the Roman uh, uh, anybody who was a tax collector for Rome, that was considered in the same class as a murderer. So uh, this, he is not a popular. This is the most hated, unpopular man in the entire city of Jerusalem. So he not only has an appearance problem, he's got an approval problem. He's not doing good. And worst of all, notice it says he was the chief tax collector, which means this is the guy on top who runs the whole scam. You couldn't pick a more hated person in the city of Jericho that Jesus stops to talk to and invite himself to dinner. Now, not only is Zacchaeus, he doesn't like his appearance and he has no approval, he's hated by everybody, but Zacchaeus doesn't like himself. How do we know that? Because he's not a proud of his achievements. He's got all this wealth, but he got it by stealing from people, from extorting it from people. You cannot be happy and guilty at the same time. You cannot give up your integrity and, and have harmony and happiness in your life. He knew he'd ripped off people. He knew that all his success was, was uh, achieved by cheating others. So he lost all his self-respect. And uh, he didn't like his life. And he's got a lot of money. He's got a lot of money. But he's a very lonely, very unhappy man. He's miserable and he feels pretty hopeless about his life. But on one single day, his life does a 180. And in one snap of a finger, bam, his life is transformed. What happens? Jesus shows up. Jesus is walking through Jericho that day. And of all the people he stops to talk to, and of all the people he pays attention to, and of all the people he invites himself to their home, he chooses the most unloved, the most disrespected, the most evil, the most unappreciated person in the entire city, a guy named Zacchaeus. Now, he's walking through town, and when he comes to the to the, uh, the tree that Zacchaeus is in, he stops, he looks up, and he says, Zacchaeus, I want you to come down. Now, this story teaches us four truths about how much you matter to God. You need to write these down. Four truths about how much you matter to God. Number one, the first thing we learn is that no matter how small I feel, Jesus notices me. No matter how small I feel, Jesus notices me. Now, as I said, Zacchaeus is very wealthy, but he's very lonely. And so when he comes, he hears Jesus has come to the city. He wants to see him. But being so short, he can't get a glimpse. So he does two things that no Middle Eastern wealthy man would ever do. First thing, he runs. He runs ahead of the crowd. Now, in those days, running was for slaves. No wealthy, self-respecting Middle Eastern man would run. But Zacchaeus doesn't care. 
he runs ahead of the crowd and he finds a tree, a sycamore tree, and he climbs up in a tree. Second thing he does, he climbs up in a tree. No self-respecting Middle Eastern businessman would climb up in a tree. That's what you have a slave do. By the way, if you want to ever see a sycamore tree, go over here to the ministry center because we planted one because outside of that building are 57 different elements to teach Bible stories to our kids. And they planted a sycamore tree when they built that building so they could teach this story. And there are actually 57 different elements around that building that teach different stories from the Bible. So we have a sycamore tree here on, on this property. Now, he's, he's shocking. He's just hoping for a glimpse of Jesus. But Jesus does something even more shocking. And the Bible says this, verse, nine, verse 3 in Luke 19. Zacchaeus was too short, but when he climbs up in a tree, but when Jesus got to the tree, he looked up. Now notice, he stops at Zacchaeus' tree, and in a packed crowd, he pauses, and of all the people in the crowd that he notices and pays attention to, he notices Zacchaeus. Can you imagine how this guy's heart started racing? Boom, 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 boom. All of a sudden, he thinks, I'm just going to get a glimpse of this guy, and all of a sudden, Jesus stops at my tree, looks up at me, and calls me my name. Hello. And he's thinking, Jesus is noticing me. And he's totally focused on me, and so everybody in the crowd is totally focused on me. He's not looking at anybody else. I'm little. I'm short. I'm overlooked. I'm insignificant. But Jesus is paying attention to me. Now, why did Jesus stop at that particular tree and look up? Because he knew exactly where Zacchaeus was. Now, let me just say this. I don't know what you're going through right now. You may feel like you're up a tree financially. You may feel like you're out on a limb relationally. You may feel like you're in a hole spiritually and nobody even knows you're there. But God knows where you are and he's paying attention to you. And he notices you. He's always had his eye on you. That's because you matter to God. There has never been a moment of your life when God took his eye off of you. When you get to heaven one day, if you trusted in Christ, there's not going to be a time when oh, God says, oh, I didn't see that one happen in your life. He saw you take your first breath. He heard you scream your first scream. He saw you being formed in your mother's womb. Why? Because he made you. God thought you up. You wouldn't exist if God hadn't thought of you first. And he wanted you alive. And he's watched every second of your life. The good, the bad, and the ugly. You may feel you're all alone right now. You may feel that what you're going through, God's a million miles away. Well, you're dead wrong. God is paying intimate, close attention. And just as much as a year before Zacchaeus even decided to go to that tree, God knew he'd be there. God knows where you are right now. He knows where you're going to be in the next hour. He knows where you're going to be next month. He knows where you're going to be next year. He knows where you're going to be on the last day of your life and the last breath you're going to take. Why? Because God is not limited by time. God does not live on the earth which rotates in a 24-hour cycle around the sun. So he's not limited by time. God can see the past, the present, and the future all at once. And he knows it all. And he never takes his eye off you. And just as much as a thousand years before this happened, God knew Zacchaeus would be in that tree at that moment. I want to tell you, God knows where you are in this moment. And he's seen everything that happened to you. He's seen every word of abuse that's been said to you that hurt, and he heard it. He saw every unkind act that's ever been done to you, and he grieved when it happened. No hurt has ever been hidden from him. He saw Zacchaeus, every mean thing that was said to him on the playground about his size when he was growing up. And God, no matter what you're going through, has not forgotten you. No matter how small, how insignificant I feel, Jesus notices me.
Look at this verse, Luke chapter 12. The Bible says, God never overlooks a single sparrow. How many sparrows do you think there are in the world? How many birds do you think there are in the world? The Bible says God notices every bird and everything they're doing every time. And he says, he pays even greater attention to you. Down to the last detail. God knows more about your life than you do. Even numbering the hairs on your head. Do you know what the greatest expression of love is? It's not giving somebody flowers. The greatest expression of love is not buying somebody a box of chocolates. The greatest expression of love is not giving them a gift card to Best Buy. The greatest expression of love is attention. It's attention, paying attention. Because when you pay attention to somebody, you're giving them your time and your time is your life and you're never gonna get that time back. You are giving them a part of your life. And when you pay attention to somebody and you look them in the eyes, that child, that husband, that wife, that friend, and you pay attention to him, you are saying, you matter to me. It is the greatest gift. Some of you grew up with parents who thought that what you needed were things. Kids don't need things, they need attention. After Easter, I'm gonna do a three week series on parenting, and one of the keys to great parenting is simply showing up and paying attention. That's what they need, they need attention. Little kids, they're, they're obvious about their need for it. They crave attention. They say, watch me, Daddy. Watch me, Daddy. And for the rest of your life, you're going to be saying, watch me, Daddy. You're still saying it today. Watch me, everybody, by the kind of car I drive. Watch me, everybody, by the kind of clothes I wear. Watch me, everybody, by the way I manicure my front lawn. Watch me, everybody, by how I make myself stand out. You crave attention. It is a fundamental human need. You crave attention. And there are people all around you, the people you work with, they're starving for attention. Your next door neighbors and the people around you, they're starving for attention. And if you wanna be like Jesus, you pay attention. You show up and you pay attention. And you be there when they need you. There are people all around you dying to be noticed. Most of you do not realize the awesome attention that God is paying to you every single second of your life. Why? Because you matter to God. Number two, not only no matter how small I feel Jesus notices me, the second thing we learn is that no matter who ignores me, Jesus knows me. No matter who ignores me, Jesus knows me. Now this is more than noticing. He doesn't just notice you as one in six billion people. He doesn't just notice you. He knows you. And he calls Zacchaeus by name. Now, all of his life, Zacchaeus has been ridiculed and rejected. First, as a young person, he's ridiculed and rejected for his size. He's not as tall as everybody else. His appearance and his physical handicap cause him to be the subject of some mean-spirited things. But then when he gets older, he's ridiculed and rejected for his dishonesty and his corruption. Now you could only imagine the kind of gossip and the kind of uh, verbal abuse that this guy probably receives daily for being a Jew who sold out to the Romans and is ripping off his own people for his own benefit. And he is being ignored by everybody. But Jesus has another surprise. And in the second part of this verse, Jesus looked up at Zacchaeus and called him by name. He knows me. He doesn't just notice me, he knows me. Zacchaeus, he said. Now imagine the shock. He knows my name. How did he know? How did Jesus know? The same reason Jesus knows your name. Because he made you. He created you. He's God. That's why he knows your name. Because God knows your name. Now, I want to tell you this. God not only knows where you are, he knows who you are. 
He not only knows what you're going through right now and knows it better than you do. He knows why you're going through it. And he knows how you feel about it, even when you don't even know how you feel about it. He knows you inside and out. He knows you. He doesn't just notice. He cares about you personally because God is not an impersonal force. Now, Jesus is walking through the city of Jericho. A crowd is following him. He stops at this tree and he looks up and he sees the most hated guy in the community. And he not only stops and notices him, he calls him out by name. Zacchaeus, come down. I'm going to your house today. I'm going to have a party at your house. He knows his name. Now, this shocks everybody. First, the fact that Jesus, how does Jesus know this guy's name? Okay. But in a packed crowd, he, he's noticing him. But, but not only that, how does he know his name? The second shock is the meaning of the name. Do you know what Zacchaeus means? It means pure one. Pure one. Now, that's the last thing Zacchaeus was. He's anything but pure. He's Mr. Corruption personified. And Jesus looks up at him and says, hey, pure one. It'd probably been decades since anybody had ever called him by his real name. They're probably calling Zacchaeus every other name in the book. <laughs> okay. Every other despised scoundrel. He's a crook. He's anything but pure. They're using all kinds of derogatory names and behind his back. But Jesus calls him by his real name. What is he doing here? He is affirming his potential rather than pointing out his past. Now follow me on this. I told you in a few weeks we're going to do a series on parenting. And by the way, you may be 80 years old, but you're still a parent. Your kids may be 60, but you'll be a parent your entire life. All right? So this is a parenting series, not just for young couples. It's for everybody. One of the principles of parenting is treat your kids the way you want them to be, not the way they are. Don't label them. Help them see what they can become. When you say, you're just, uh, what are you doing? Only reinforcing the past. Don't tell it like it is. Tell it like it can be. Guys, if you want your wife to treat you like a king, you treat her like a queen. You treat people the way you want them to be, and then they tend to measure up to your expectations. Jesus looks at Zacchaeus, and he doesn't point out his flaws. He says, hey, pure one. Come on down. Now follow me on this. The reason your friends are afraid to come to Christ and the reason why you are afraid to get close to Jesus is you think if I get close to Jesus, he's going to scold me, he's going to nag me, and he's going to tell me and remind me of all the things I've done wrong in my life. Wrong. Jesus goes to the biggest center in town in the people's view and he doesn't say oh Zacchaeus let me give you a hundred things you've done wrong in the last three weeks no he looks up at him and he says hey uh, pure one let's go party what's going on here he is treating Jesus he's treating Zacchaeus the way he wants him to be treated he said, I know you, I made you, I know your potential. I'm not looking at your sin, I'm looking at what I made you to be. And I made you to be a pure one. And you can't forget him. Look at this next verse. This verse out of Isaiah, God says, can a mother forget her nursing child? Can she feel no love for a child she has born? The answer is obviously no. If you're nursing a baby, there's no way if you're nursing a baby, you're going to forget that baby. It's impossible. If you're nursing a baby, you cannot forget a baby. But he says, even if that were possible, God says, I would never forget you. See, I have engraved your name on the palms of my hand. When Jesus Christ was crucified on the cross. And we're gonna look at this next Sunday night when we look at the passion again. 
They nailed nails through his hands. Those created scars. And God says, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. This is how much I love you. When you get to heaven, there aren't gonna be any scars in heaven. You're not gonna have any imperfections or any scars in heaven. The only person with scars in heaven will be Jesus. For the rest of eternity, we can see how much he loved us. I have engraved you on the palms of my hand. Look at the scars on my brow from the crown of thorns. Look at the spear scar in my side. Look at the nails in my hand, the nails in my feet. These are the scars that say, this is how much I love you. I call this God's tattoo verse. God says, there's no way I could ever forget how much I love you. I've engraved you on the palms of my hand. You see, in spite of Jesus' sin, in spite of his, uh, Zacchaeus' sin, Jesus affirms him. You see, God has created you. You're his custom creation. He made you. You weren't mass produced. When he formed you, he uniquely formed you for a purpose and he knows that purpose for your life. And he didn't use an assembly line and he lovingly crafted you and he knows your name and he's impressed you on the palms of his hands. I like to say it this way. God has your picture in his wallet. Do you realize that? You're not number 1,486,282, whatever. God has your picture in his wallet. He made you to love you. And there's never been a moment of your life that he didn't love you, that he didn't see, notice, and that he didn't know what's going on in your life. Some of you have had some pretty tough shots in life. And you've had some pretty mean things said about you. And you can still remember the names you've been called. Names you've been called by your dad. Names you've been called by your mom. Names you've been called by people on the playground or at school. And you've been the brunt of verbal abuse. And you can still recall the, recall the words. And so you have a pretty hard time feeling good about you. But I want you to remember this. Even though all those other people called you all those other names... You'll never amount to anything. Why can't you be like your brother or your sister? You're going to fail. You're, you're going to end up in prison. On, on, and on, and on. And all those things that people said about you. And all the names they called you. You're dumb. You're uncoordinated. You're a klutz. You don't matter. And all of that doesn't really matter. Because what matters is not the names they've called you, but the fact that he knows your name. And he says, pure one, I see in you what I made you to be, and I've never given up on that. No matter how insignificant I feel, Jesus notices me. And no matter how I, you know, uh, things go wrong in my life and people ignore me, Jesus knows me. Number three, this is a bigger one. No matter what I've done, Jesus wants me. Whoa. No matter what I've done, Jesus wants me. Now Zacchaeus' appearance made him feel insecure and lonely, inferior. Zacchaeus' accusers made him feel bitter and resentful. He's pretty mad at society. But Zacchaeus' sins made him feel guilty and ashamed. So Jesus does the most shocking thing of all. He invites himself to Zacchaeus' home. He doesn't wait for an invitation. He takes the initiative and invites himself to the worst guy's home in the city of Jericho. Luke 19. Jesus looked up and Zacchaeus called him by name. Says, Zacchaeus, come down quickly for I'm going to be a guest in your home today. You think that was a shocker? Now, Jesus knows that Zacchaeus would be filled with guilt and shame and would never think himself worthy enough to have Jesus in his home. Zacchaeus wouldn't even consider inviting Jesus to come to his house. He goes, man, I'm, I'm a sinner. I'm no good, man. I'm a cheat. Uh, I'm not worthy of having a relationship with Jesus. I'm not good enough to have a relationship with Jesus. I've done too many bad things. I don't deserve to have him in my home. So Jesus takes initiative. And he looks up and he says, Zacchaeus, come on down. How long do you think it took him to get out of that tree? 
I think he probably did it in record time. I think he slid down the tree. I think you're saying, I don't care if I get splinters in my butt. I'm hitting the ground as fast as I can. Because I'm been invited, I've been invited by Jesus to take him to my house. Blew his mind. Now the fact is, you're ashamed of a lot of things you've done in your life. How do I know that? Because you're a human being. We've all done things that we're ashamed of. I've done things that I'm ashamed of. The Bible says all have sinned and fallen short. He's not the only short guy. We've all fallen short. I fall short as a parent. I fall short as a husband. I fall short as a pastor. I fall short as a person. I don't measure up to my standards, much less God's perfect standards, and neither do you. You don't keep all your promises. You don't measure up to all your standards. You fall short. Why? Because all have sinned, everybody. I had a pastor friend who was teaching on that verse one time. He said, thank God he forgives all our falling shorts. <laughs> and yes, if your shorts fall, he forgives those too. <laughs> you've done a lot of things you're ashamed of. You've, you've had plenty of time to hurt people with your own personal brand of selfishness. And we all have our own personal brand of selfishness. You hurt people in your selfish way, and I hurt people in my selfish way, and everybody has their own personal brand, but it's all the same. But you know what? Jesus is more interested in changing you than condemning you. He said, I didn't come to condemn the world. I, I came to save it. He says that in John 3. If you want to be like Jesus Christ, then don't go out condemning the world. Jesus said, I didn't come to condemn the world. I came to save it. And I decided about 30 years ago, I wanted to have a ministry like Jesus. I didn't come to condemn the world. I came to save it. Which means I don't spend any of my time condemning culture. Why? Because Jesus didn't. He said, I didn't come to condemn the world. I came to save it. You see, most Christians spend all their time either condemning the world, saying how badly society sucks, and then B, looking for a political solution to figure out how to get rid of the suckiness. <laughs> Neither of those work. Spending all your time condemning society won't change it. And looking for a political answer to solve the solve problems of society won't change it either. God so loved the world, he didn't send a politician. <laughs> okay? Why? Because you can't change people's hearts by laws. No law will turn a bigot into somebody who loves all the races. Not, not, only Jesus can get rid of racism in your heart. Only Jesus can get rid of selfishness in your heart. No law is going to turn people who are selfish into unselfish people. Jesus said, I didn't come to condemn the world. I came to save it. And so no matter what I've done, Jesus wants me. And he wants you to know him and he wants you to love him because he loves you and he wants you to know how much you love him. You remember the story of the prodigal son, the kid who tells his father, dad, give me my half of the inheritance. And he splits and he goes to Sunset Strip in Jerusalem and he spends all of his money on wine, women, and song, mostly women. And he ends up feeding pigs in a pigsty and finally realizes this, this doesn't work. So he goes home to his dad with a humble attitude and smelling of the pigsty, the father runs out to greet his younger son. And he grabs him in a big bear hug and says, my son has come home. Let's have a party. He doesn't say to his son, a son, go in, um, get a bath, get shaved, put on some clean clothes, get rid of that stinking pig smell, and then I'll give you a bear hug. No, he says, I love you just the way you are. Jesus loves you just the way you are but he loves you too much to let you stay that way. So he's gonna help you change. Many of you remember a story I told years ago when I, I went and visited a prison where we had a Celebrate Recovery Church, purpose-driven Celebrate Recovery Church up in a maximum security prison in Northern California called Sierra Prison. 6,000 maximum security prisoners. And they had invited me to come speak on the prison uh, yard. And it was about the size of a, of a football field, about 6,000 prisoners. I mean, that was everywhere. And I, uh, I got out to speak, 
And I wanted to get everybody's attention, so I pulled a $50 bill out of my wallet and I held it up and I said, is there anybody here who'd like this $50 bill? 6,000 hands went up. I crumpled it all up in my hand. And I said, anybody still want this $50 bill? 6,000 hands went up. I took that $50 bill and I tore it and I put little tears all through it. I said, anybody still want it? Every, every hand went up. I took that $50 bill and I threw it in the dirt and I spit on it. And I took my foot and I crushed it into the ground and I held it up and I said, anybody still want it? Every hand went up. And then I said this, guys, a lot of you, this is what your daddy did to you. Your daddy said, you're worthless. You're crud, you're crap, you're nothing. You're never gonna amount to anything. You're gonna end up in prison or die. And then your dad walked out on you and you were left to be raised by your mom. And you've been hit on and spit on and crushed in the ground. But you have not lost one cent of your original value to God. I don't really care what you've done. I don't care who you've done it with or how long you've done it. What the matters is not what you, where you've been, but what direction your feet are headed today. And Jesus says, no matter what you've done, Zacchaeus, I want you. I want to party with you. I want to have a relationship with you. I want to go to your house and have dinner. I want a relationship with you. And God says that to you. That's how much you matter to God. Yes, you've blown it. Yes, you have. And the starting point of salvation is when you swallow your pride and admit, I need help. I need a savior. I need God in my life. God doesn't save prideful people. He saves humble, not arrogant people. People who say, I need your help. I've made mistakes. I've blown it. I've done wrong. I've sinned. And I need to turn and go your way. And you've made a lot of mistakes in your life, but you have not lost one cent of your value to the creator who made you. And Jesus wants a relationship with you. He wants to come to your house and have dinner. In fact, here's what he says, the next verse. I stand at the door, the door of your life. I stand at the door and I knock. And if you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and eat with you and you with me. There's one other great truth. Number four, no matter what others say about me, Jesus affirms me. No matter what others say, Jesus affirms me. They may call me this name or that. They may criticize this or that. They may misjudge this or that. But what matters is that Jesus affirms me. Now, when Jesus goes and he pays attention to the biggest sinner in town, the most hated man that everybody despises. And he says, I want to go to your house. I want a relationship with you. Jesus did the unthinkable, and the reaction is swift, and it is immediate. The cat crowd goes nuts. And in verse 7, all the people saw this, this interaction between Z Jesus and Zacchaeus, and they began to complain, Jesus is having dinner with a sinner. Jesus is staying with a sinner. And what's his reaction to that? What does he do? He defends this guy in the front. He defends this guy to the religious self-righteous people. Next verse, Jesus says, this man is a true son of Abraham. Does that mean he hadn't sinned? No, he's just saying he's one of us. He's going to be in my family. And if you hear my voice, he says, and I, the son of man, have come to seek and to save people like him who were lost. He affirms him. He defends him. He protects him. 
Jesus always did that in the face of criticism from religious people. Now, you may have been coming to Saddleback for weeks or months or man, maybe even years. And you've never really opened your life to Christ. You know about him, but you've never said, yes, today's your day. Because think about this. Knowing the fact that Jesus sees everything in my life, that he made me, he notices me, he knows my name, he cares about me, and no matter what I've done, he wants me, and he wants a relationship with me. How should I respond to Jesus? The same way Zacchaeus did. Look at the next verse, verse 6. So Zacchaeus came down at once. He didn't wait. He didn't delay. He didn't put it off. So let me have a week to think about it. He came down at once and received him with joy. Have you received Jesus with joy? I love the message translation. It says Zacchaeus scrambled out of the tree. He opened his heart and his life immediately. Now follow me on this, the logic on this. With a God who loves you this much, with a God who loves, he created you, he made you, he saves you, he's engraved you on the palms of his hands, he wants a relationship with you in spite of all your rebellion. Can you name one logical, rational, intelligent reason for saying no to your creator? If you can think of any logical, rational, intelligent reason for saying no to the God who made you, loves you, saves you, wants you in a relationship. If you could think of one good reason, stand up and tell us right now. Because I can't think of one. In fact, to reject this is stupid. It's insane. It is the most irrational thing to do, to say, I reject the creator who loves me that much. It is the only sane approach to life. Now notice the change in Zacchaeus is immediate. Look at the next verse. Zacchaeus, after he's shown this love and grace, he says to the Lord, Lord, I'll give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I've cheated anybody, I'll give back four times as much. Now I want you to circle the phrase, I'll give. He says it twice. I'll give and I'll give. Now, the moment Zacchaeus says that, he was converted. He was saved. The moment he says, I'll give. You say, how do you know that's his conversion? Because the most selfish man in the city became the most generous man like that. And only Jesus can do that. All of a sudden, he's going, how can I help the poor? How can I help other people? How can I pay back the people I've ripped off and cheated? Only Jesus can change a totally self-centered, selfish, it's all about me, and I don't care who I have to put down to get a lot of money, and who I have to climb over in order to get to the top. Only Jesus can change that. And to have a guy who's going, it's all about me, to how can I help other people? That's his conversion. How do you know when you've really met Christ? I'll tell you how you know. Your attitude toward giving changes. You become generous. All of a sudden you go, it's not about me. I want to give back. How can I help people? How can I help my neighbors? How can I help the poor? How can I help my family? How can I help the people around me? How can I help people who don't know about Jesus? All of a sudden you become generous. You become like Christ. And he gives a public demonstration of his change. Jesus asks us to make a public demonstration of our change. You know what it's called today? Baptism.
baptism says, I want the whole world to know that I'm changing on the inside, that he's changing me, that I want to be a different person. I want Christ in my life. If you've never been baptized, you know, I can't think of a better time than Easter season. And we're going to, today after the service, baptize. And in all of our different campuses. And if you can't be baptized today, pull out a card and say, I want to be baptized. And we'll make an appointment. Because you need to do this during the Easter season. Now, I don't know what you're going through. As I said, you may feel like you're out on a limb. Relationally or financially or physically. You may feel like you're up a tree. And I invite you to jump out of a tree and into the loving arms of the Savior who made you. Let's bow our heads. Would you pray this prayer? Dear God, just say it in your mind. Dear God, man, I, I have tried to find my worth on all the false ways. I've judged my value on how I look, my appearance, and on what I own my affluence and I've tried to support my value on what I've done my achievement and it makes me overwork and on how well I'm liked and I've really in many ways lived for the approval of other people thank you for this story of Zacchaeus thank you that no matter how small and insignificant I feel Jesus you notice me everything in my life Thank you that, you that no matter who ignores me, you know my name. And you have engraved me on the palms of your hand. You've got my picture in your wallet. Wow. Thank you, Jesus, that no matter what I've done, you want me. You want to come to my house. You want a relationship, not a religion, a relationship with me. And thank you that no matter what other people say about me, you affirm me. When people complain about me, you say, this is, a, this is my child. Today, I do the most logical, rational thing. I surrender to your love. I invite you into my heart and my life and my mind. I want to learn to trust you. Please start making the changes in me. Thank you for not being ashamed of me. I don't want to be ashamed of you. And if I need to be baptized, I want to be baptized to show my joy. In your name I pray. Amen.